Hello everyone and welcome along to your Sunday edition of the TII podcast. My name is Craig Dennett and I'm your host today as we get stuck into all things Rangers transfer rumours. We'll also touch on a little bit of the, the fallout from the Old Farm game last week, but I think we're all pretty much sick of that already. Joining me to talk through all of that, we have John Walker. How are you doing, John? Good, mate. Good, mate. Excellent. Nice. I was expecting a bit more there, but nice and short. And we're also joined by Tommy McIntyre as well. How are you doing, Tommy? Good, mate. Good, mate. There, there you go. I can see, I can see how this is going to go. go. <laughs> so, as I said, we'll, we'll touch on um, some of the fallout from the SFA um, controversy following the old firm. We'll, we'll touch on mainly transfer rumours and, and what our thoughts on left backs, our thoughts on strikers, our thoughts on right wingers and our thoughts on um, cent central midfielders. So we'll kick off firstly with the SFA stuff. John, I'll come to you. First of all, it's been a week of tit for tat and, and toys out the pram. Um, I th I, I'm definitely sick of it. What have you made of what's happened this week? I am on board with that. I'm just getting to the point where it's childish. My thing with referees in Scotland is very simple. We're paying for a technology that we don't have the cameras to use. We do not. You've seen it with the Celtic motherwell offside. I keep seeing that getting shared. We do not have enough cameras in the stadium to use a technology that the English Premier League are using with like 20, 30 cameras. So see, pay all that money. I'd rather we retrained refs and had good qualified refs and worked on upskilling the referees. So when we have the money, when somebody starts doing their job and gets Scottish football more money, we can actually invest in more cameras and use the technology if we want to with better trained qualified refs because it's just the referees it's not Willie Collum it's not Nick Walsh it's not Steve McLean it's the whole thing like I see referees with no linesmen down in the seventh tier of Scottish football handling an absolute war on the pitch better than referees with four officials on TV do an old fun like that's what I see week to week where people could end up in scraps because there's only one referee no police no security and they manage a battle with 22 people, managers and fans, they manage it well, more often than not. So I would rather see those type of refs upskilled and moved through and get the Deadwood, who we apparently can't replace because of this, out of the way and improve the standard overall. I just think it's it, it doesn't help. When it comes from Rangers, nobody backs it. When it comes to Celtic, nobody backs it. Unless Rangers and Celtic both come forward and go, that was a pretty atrocious refereeing performance overall, but it will never happen. It will never happen because it will more often than not, only highlight when one team loses, they'll be the ones that moan, and the other team will moan when that happens to them. Exactly, that's exactly what we've seen in, the, in this last week, in terms of, I guess, lots of the um, lots of the voices in the media coming out um, and saying that Rangers are wrong to be doing this, despite having done it themselves when it's been the other way around um, previously. Tommy, John kind of touched on it that, Rangers, Rangers will come out when Rangers are unhappy. Celtic will come out when Celtic are unhappy. Do you think Rangers have approached this in the right, in the right manner, in the right way? How you would expect the club to approach it? I think they probably approached it in the only way that they could. I don't necessarily think that was ever going to get anywhere. If I'm being brutally honest, but there's a there's a PR game to some extent there. So I'm not overtly criticising the club. Do I think that they should have been a little bit? Um, harder with their tone and should have controlled the narrative as opposed to being pushed out um, in different ways. No, I, I probably don't actually. I think that the communications team could have done a better job here. But, you know, one hand behind their back. I think John's nailed the really important part which is, you know, as human beings we tend to love the idea of technology. We want to be early adopters and we want to get it in and that will solve all our problems and all that. You can put VAR in anywhere but if you don't have enough cameras and enough ability to actually review things, you're going to get problems. The quality of our referees is not good enough. That's why we don't have rep referees represented at the UEFA and FIFA top levels as well. Um, other than conspiracy theories and stuff like that, I just, I mean, I might not win me many friends with people listening and stuff like that, but I don't believe that there's a conspiracy out there against any particular club. I believe that we've got human referees who sometimes allow themselves to be put in positions and with that particular one uh, the other weekend, I think what really drove people was it's clear that somebody tried to cover their tracks. You know, that whole kind of Fargo experience. You make one mistake that leads to another mistake that leads to another mistake and all of a sudden it's snowballed into a, oh my God, everything's on fire. No, it's not. There's nothing to see here type of scenario. And that's when you get back into that political angle at the end, which is 
the governing body and the disparate relationship that the club has with them. And, you know, just to kind of get to the end of that, it's a wider answer than we need here, right? But things like, oh, we don't want a referee to be part of our games and stuff like that. No governing body is ever going to agree to that. Right. So that's 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 slightly grandstanding and you're only going to get one sort of answer. So those types of things I, I don't think were particularly helpful. Will the club right to call it out? Yeah, to an extent and, and ask for the explanation and ask for the audio. It could have been killed really simply if they'd have just released the audio. That's the problem at the heart of this. Just do that, draw a line through it and say it was a mistake or whatever. So yeah, that's a longer answer than it was needed here, but the underpinning point is Jones, which is you're going to get continual points of this when you've got your two biggest clubs not willing to go into battle together to get a better process and you don't have the quality of referees or the equipment to actually back out far. I would rather we get rid of it and just had better referees and lived with the problems because you're going to get mistakes rather than turn around and saying, right, draw me some more lines and show me some more camera angles six days after the event or anything like that. Yeah, John, were you going to come in there on the, the release of the audio side of things? I've said a few things, right? I think see the BBC and Scottish football in general have such an opportunity to improve the whole broadcast, and I'll get to my point here, the whole broadcast of the league, right? I watch MLS, I cover all the Scots abroad footballs. MLS do a brilliant thing every single week. They have the head of refereeing come on and explain key decisions to a nationwide audience on every game, rather than Neil McCann and James McFadden arguing whether it's a penalty to one person or the other and going, well, he's a Celtic man, he's a Rangers man. Head of refereeing comes on and goes through all the key details and goes, we felt this was this because of that. See, even not releasing the audio, see if they just came out at the end and goes, we didn't see a handball in the scenario. We've looked at it now and we feel it would have been a handball. But retrospectively, we if we'd stopped that, we would have looked for offside, which we'd missed previously. But the right decision was met, but we didn't follow the right process to do so. I honestly think human beings are way more... Obviously, you'll still get rational people to go off their nut and go, this is ridiculous. Most often not, like they did with Liverpool Tottenham, it was chaos for 24 hours. But once the audio was released, they kind of went, oh, they've made an error. Like, what are we meant to do? That's, See if somebody that, owns up to it, that's it. That's the spot on point. I, I couldn't agree more with, with John here on this. And that every you know everything fills into the vacuum to that point. Or you're not seeing you're seeing the wrong angle of pictures, you're not getting actual clarity from the governing body. There's just this whole clickbait comes round about it. To John's point, somebody comes out and goes, right, rightly or wrongly, that's what we were thinking at the time. It's been a clear and obvious mistake by us. Apologies, we're still learning. Like John says, people go off the deep end for a couple of days, but you'll go, right, well, at least they're being honest and open. It's this whole it's behind closed doors. There's something secret there. There's something not being shared with us. That whole kind of brown packet conversation, so to speak, the audio not being shared. Lancet, just share it and go, yeah, we dropped the ball here. Sorry about that. This is what we're trying to do in the background. These are the enhancements. This is what it looks like. It's an ongoing process. Right, okay, yeah, we yeah. can all get on board with that because nothing comes out of the packet fully formed. Yeah, the SFA have got an added issue in terms of it was the last game or it was one of the last games before the winter break so there is now just this vacuum of there's no next game for for two weeks three weeks there's no there's no next controversy there's none of that the sfa are effectively having this vacuum filled with a controversy that they don't want to be talking about and they don't want to to share anything with tommy where does where does this end does it just end with two camps entrenched and that's that's how it is. And then for the rest of the season and beyond, everything is a conspiracy and everything is for or against certain clubs. Or is it is there a way that this that everyone just gets past this? The realist in me, the, the pragmatist says it's going to just end up in two camps and everybody thinks that everybody's against them, right? It's it's unfortunately the nature of where we are. If people do want to um see progress, then Rangers and Celtic need to get round the table and need to have a conversation and have a united front and push at the same door at the same time. Because if you've got both of those clubs doing it, then there's a there's an angle uh, there and it drags a lot of other clubs along with them. But that's a working relationship that still needs to, to you know, the, the, not exactly um, the best of friends, obviously. And there's a lot of water under that particular bridge at the moment. But if you want better things for the entire game, which affects us all, um, that's the only way. Do I think that's going to happen in the short to medium term? Not a chance. I think people love seeing statements and love seeing headlines and that feeling of being hard done by. 
the only other point I'd maybe just put to that as well is just come back to the vacuum point. It's absolutely counter to what the the SFA etc are saying about throwing the refs and their officials under a bus. Actually, you're leaving the door wide open for conversation all across the the you know the Christmas sorry the post Christmas break and the international break. If you'd have just a walked out with us and shared the audio and said, yeah, it was a mistake. Yeah, it might be focused on one person, right? But at least it's a legitimate mistake or whatever, as opposed to the entirety of your officiating team being chucked under the bus as well. So, yeah, short, medium term, do I see it getting better? Absolutely not. Um, and there's a lot of actors who like to stoke that particular fire as well. It sells, it sells websites, it clickbaits and all that type of stuff as well. So we probably need to get beyond ourselves on that if we want to, if we want to actually see it get better. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to be fair, here we are eight days on from a, a game still talking <laughs> still talking about it. So that kind of proves the point in itself. Um, I spoke about the vacuum that um, was left or is left naturally when the winter break kicks off. Thankfully, we've had plenty of Rangers transfer rumours to, to fill that vacuum. The TII group chat has been going mental ever since, um, I think, for you, ever since before. The, uh, the transfer window opened in itself. We've got plenty of areas to cover. But, John, first of all, this seems a lot busier than any tra January transfer window that I remember in terms of Rangers rumours, in terms of the movers and shakers in, within the club and, and, and potentially weavers as well. It's it, I wasn't really expecting it, I don't think. I don't know if that's because I've become accustomed to we don't really hear Rangers rumours until pretty much over the line. But there seems to be a lot more noise around the club uh, at the start of this transfer window. I don't know if it is because of maybe how specific Clement wants to be about the players left behind. Like Gio, I mean, I don't know how many times we've changed managers during the season, but Gio came in to a previously championship winning side, so probably didn't need a lot of change in his opinion and been six points clear. McLeish came in before Christmas once and again was taking an advocate side that was filled with talent that just needed a, a fresh voice. So I think this is probably the first time where a team's been so bad that when a new person's came in, he's already been able to assess and go, him, 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 no good enough, need him out, need replacements for those positions. And also, as we always talk about, our injury record is atrocious. So there is need for bodies. So I think it's probably more more that. And the fact that we do have this winter break, he's probably viewed it as going, we've got an opportunity here to get people in the door before our next game, get them to Spain, get them in the training camp and have them ready to play. As soon as we go, I think it's probably just a, a mixture of all that, to be honest. Yeah, Tommy, John spoke about um, the fact that Philippe Coman has probably identified the players that he likes, the players he doesn't like, where he wants to the, the sort of churn in the squad to be. Just before we start delving into specific players or specific positions and some of the, the names rumoured around that, how important a transfer window is this for Rangers? Oh, it's, it's the most important transfer window since the last transfer window. Uh, it's the it's just the nature of nature of Rangers, I suppose, at this point in time. But yeah, listen, it is, and, and with that, there needs to come a bit of realism as well. You know, Philippe Clement's done a great job of getting the team into a place of being trophy winners, qualified for the last sixteen, and competitive in the title race. I mean, last result notwithstanding, right? But when you're two games in hand, you're two points. Right, that is competitive, and being able to do that puts up a certain level of expectation now that probably wasn't there when Philippe Clement came in the door. Right? Now it's about, right, what can he do to actually move people out or get people in who are going to be starters? I mean, you look at uh, Fabio Silva, for example, then you're looking at other players. I saw people on social media saying, right, you need starters, etc. That's fair. You do need starters for our squad, but it's always very hard as well to then go and say, right, I need people who have been playing regularly, but they're oddly available to get punted out into another team, even though they've been playing for their team regularly. So it's always difficult. You're looking at the loan market. You might do some of that um, Raskin Cantwell type of deal as well. So, yeah, it's incredibly difficult transfer window, the January one, but it's incredibly important in that if they get it right, Rangers have got a real chance of coming out at the end of this season as title winners. Right? I'm not going to get ahead of myself with trebles and all that type of stuff, right? But a double, right? And that's exceptional considering where we were with the first 10 weeks or when it was the start of the season, I should say. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's just depending on can they identify the right areas. I'm I'm a middle, a wide right, 
upfront type of person. I think that's really where our core problems are right now. And you take into account some of the, the, the injuries that we've got. I won't I won't do that right now. I'm sure we'll talk about that as we go into the pod. But yeah, it's it's incredibly important. And it's important because one, we've got ourselves in a competitive place. Two, lots of fans are waiting for the the club to back the manager. And it's, it's not always as simple as backing the manager. You have to identify, yeah, 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 get everybody across the line. But also, Philippe Clement will be looking at, right, can I move people out of the squad? I don't want to just keep adding in bodies, even if they're starters, because you end up with a big, unhappy squad there. And he's very much focused on the psychology of that and the harmony and being in touch with players and stuff like that as well. So it, it's not just about picking up the phone and people desperate to, to come in the door and getting them over the line immediately. That's that's the hard part. So maybe what I'm saying is there's a wee bit of pragmatism um, and responsibility there that people just need to understand that it can't just be no holds barred, everybody come in and a brand new team's fashioned. Pragmatism in football fans, it's not good. It's never going to catch on really, is uh, it? No, I'm, trying to get, I'm trying to get it over the line in this pod. Everybody <laughs> needs to be pragmatic, but I still expect us to be in the title race, obviously. <laughs> John, I think when we headed into this transfer window, the kind of noises we were hearing from around the club was that a, a striker, a, a central midfielder and a left-back were potentially the kind of areas of the of the team that we were starting to look at. Given the rumours that we're about to discuss, so it definitely seems strikers on that list. Left-back will be on that list, given the, the obviously recent movement around Ridvan uh, as well. Um, it actually seems a bit strange that centre-back seems to be on that list as well um, but we'll, we'll kind of come on to each of those positions but starting with I guess the most exciting one but also the one we know needs addressed the most um, which is the striker the one that won't go away and whether it's just fan talk or not we're I guess we're still up in the air about that one but Warren Shankland to Rangers seems to be the strongest striker rumour we've had we've also seen uh, Emmanuel Dennis who is uh, who was exceptional for Watford for a season and um, in the Premier League, he's recently he's signed for Nottingham Forest, but been on loan in Turkey. What have you made of these sort of striker rumours? Where do you land on who would be best? The Warren Shankland one's obviously the one I'd be keen to focus on, first of all, because it's it's just not going away. Yeah, the, the Shankland one's... The Shankland one's just so, so obvious. The only thing that people seem to be caught up on is the fee. Like, it seems like that is the only stumbling box in people's minds. Um so bored of modern football and ageism in this scenario is that a youngster that's 21 that hasn't made the grade isn't good enough because he's too old to make the grade but a 28 year old is too old to play for Rangers and be signed for a certain amount of money it's absolutely ludicrous Walter Smith's success at Rangers was built on signing the right 27, 28 year old striker, Gordon Jury, Kerry Miller uh, the second time round Marco Negri would didn't win the title all those players tick boxes at the right age. Lauren Shankland, if you look at his career, had a howling first few years of his career. He just didn't make the cut. At Aberdeen, he wasn't good enough in the Premier League. He dropped down divisions. He was up and down, up and down, up and down. From the minute he's went to United, his just trajectory has been upward to the point that he's now at the peak. He's 20 years old. He's at the peak of his powers. That's when you sign Lauren Shankland. There's a reason we weren't sure about signing him from A United for 250 grand. There's a reason we didn't sign him and beer shot or try to get rid of him. There's a reason we're now linked, whether or not there's any substantiation behind that. There's a reason we're now linked. He is at the peak. He's going to be at the peak for the next two or three years. That five million, I don't think it'll ever be five million, but that money will be a drop in the ocean if we win three titles in a row under Lauren Shankland being our centre forward and making Champions League money. And you need to forget your transfer model sometimes when a signing makes sense. The transfer model should be buying players in that you can sell on for a profit. We've only done it with Bassey, really, Joe Aribo, Glenn Kamara. Those will come, but you need people that are going to deliver you titles because unless you deliver titles, people aren't interested in your players. You need to be winning trophies and playing well for people to notice your footballers, to want to buy them. Lauren Shanklin's one that could come in. And I think we talked about it yesterday. I don't know who put it up. Was that Cantwell's the second most creative player in the league on stats? Yeah. Yep. The only thing stopping Cantwell hitting numbers of assists that are 10, 15, 20 is a striker who can convert XG above his goal rate, and that man is Lauren Shankland. I think I think that's completely fair. I've I've been on board with the signing of Lauren Shankland from from the get go of, of this transfer rumor. Um, I, I, I'm also with you, John, in terms of I don't get 
even the fee side of things, people still seem to think we're 15 years ago and you you want to pay one million pounds for a top striker in the Scottish League. It's not that's not where that's not where how this works or where this lands. John, I think it was yourself that put up a tweet. It was quite a long time ago now, but basically said, you know what, offer Hearts three million pounds and put their resolve to the test. See how much they want that extra million or million and a half. Offer, offer them three million pounds and and see where we go with that. And that's I think I'm very much in that. I don't think three million pound is extortionate. I don't think three million pound is over the over the score for someone like Lauren Shankland. I, I would even go as far to say I'm not. I don't think four million pound is over the score for Lauren Shankland. You've seen what we paid for Dessers. You've seen what we paid for Lammers. You know what? Lauren Shankland's a proven goal scorer in this league, and and we should be we should be going at even at rates at, at that. You, I wouldn't feel like we're being held to ransom at that price. Do you, do you know the thing that, that really uh, that I think we get mixed up a bit with, with being old firm fans as well? Because Celtic fans, my mates, are, are the same when I talk to them about Miofsky, potentially going to them. Is see a player that's playing in Serie A and maybe has half the goals of a Lauren Shankland, we seem to value that more as a paying a premium. Or we'll pay four and a half million for that player because they're playing in a better league and scoring goals. Playing in the league that you're buying the player from, number one, should be a premium on the player. And secondly, and it was something Walter Smith and Dick Advocat done, see players that have a habit of scoring goals against you, they could cost you the title at the end of the season. So get them fucking out the door of that club and get them in your door. Dick Advocat done it with Billy Dodds because he scored three goals for Dundee United against us in a t- title that we only won by nine points in the end because Celtic collapsed. That's what you do, is you go and sign, if there's a standard player who's got a habit of scoring against you, as a top scorer in the league, and knows the league consistently scoring. I honestly don't know how many more boxes ticked someone wants when they look at a Lauren Shankland over trying to find someone in Belgium, France, Italy that look like they've got a good conversion rate, but have no idea what Scottish football is about. And realistically, we have no idea how they would adapt to Scottish football. Yeah, Tommy, I think one of the one of the discussions that I've heard going on around the Lauren Shankland was we we can we kinda know he's good enough for Scotland. We know that Rangers will create enough chances that his 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 rate will be good. But is he good enough to go up to that next level in terms of European competition and that side of things? My argument back is that we just need a goal scorer. We need someone that will be in that box and will finish chance after chance after chance. We'll, we'll create enough chances. I think John's spoken about the sort of the, I guess, the trend the start of XG at this moment in time. Like it's, we're creating the chances. We're just not scoring the goals. And the strikers that we, we've we loved at Rangers, the strikers that live long in the memory, you've got Ali McCoy, you've got Chris Boyd, are the strikers that they didn't really do a great deal much else outside of the box. So they didn't really do a great deal much else in, in the overall play, but they were there when it mattered most to put the ball in the back of the net. And I think Lauren Shankland probably does offer a bit more than a Chris Boy did outside the box, but it, it, we, we need someone to score goals. And it, like John says, this one just seems a no-brainer. It's a bit strange that there is such discourse around around this signing. It's, it's snobbery, is what it is. It's snobbery. Uh, I was actually laughing away at myself as well when, when John was talking about signing players who've scored goals against you. And I went, when did... When did we play uh, against Oleg Selenko? <laughs> and then I remembered, obviously, it was uh, it was international uh, and stuff like that as well. But uh, my mind always goes back to Oleg Selenko when it comes to things like that. Um, God, God bless him and all that. But uh, yeah, listen, it's, it's nobody pure, pure and simple. And uh, yeah, you do need to. You can't walk past the 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 cost, right? Because you don't want to pay exorbitant fees and all that type of thing. But you, you don't you go and have the conversation with Hearts. I mean, he's got what is it May 25? His contract runs out. As John was saying, the peak of his powers is 20, 28, or whatever it is. It's the right time for Hearts to sell as well. It fits their model, right? Because they can cash in. Yeah, we, we've been burnt a little bit because we spent a lot of money in the summer on Sam Lammers and serial Dessels and buying large. They haven't quite shown shown that back. Yeah, you can also talk about, well, what about Europe and is he able to do that and all that type of stuff. Go and win your title first. All right? Yep. <laughs> buy, buy players that will win you your title and then worry about your automatic entry to the CL. Uh, if you're being brutally brutally honest, right? I mean, UEL qualification is fantastic. Do I think Lauren Shanklin will score goals at that level of Europe anyway? Yeah, I do. He's done it. You, you know what I mean? He's, he's also broken an international team. He's round about that. I think if he was at a club like Rangers, his international prospects would be enhanced as well. And that just adds to some of that um, glamour roundabout a player sometimes. So 
Yeah, but by and large, to cut through it all, go and sign players that will do you the job domestically and make you champions. Then you iterate your squads from there. The only difference or maybe the, the additional impact in this particular conversation is one, once you get into what our hearts really looking for, they might not want to sell to somebody in the same league or they might want an exorbitant fee that you just can't break your model for anyway, right? And that's fine, but you've asked the question. Or two, Philippe Clement and his staff have got a advocate style Michael Moles up their sleeve where they go, there's this wee gem that nobody's really seen, but I can get him out of a, I think Moles would be Trekt, wasn't it? Yeah. I can pull him out here and, and it'll really sparkle. But if they don't, then turn around and look at your domestic league and there's a guy banging in the goals. To the Cantwell point, you put him in with better players and then all of a sudden you've got somebody who's who's up, up the numbers, not just for themselves, but across the team because other members of the squad can look at, right, now my assists are going up. Now I've got somebody who's a better focal point. Now I've got somebody who's also good in the dressing room and all that type of stuff. Yeah, and then it comes back to, right, can I shift out some of the other players in those forward positions who aren't doing it because I don't want to keep the squad overly large. Aye, if the number's right, then it's a no-brainer. Go and sign guys who are banging them in in your league. Yeah, and that's it. Make it sound so simple, Tommy. It's almost as though they've been watching football for a long time. Well, I was going to, I was going to say, I mean, I'm sure somebody will kind of jump in and do the VAR of this conversation at some point, right? But I, I, that's it. I mean, I don't think anybody out there, I don't think anybody, and it'd be interesting to see in the comments, right? But I don't think anybody out there would say that Lauren Shankland wouldn't be an upgrade on our forward line right now. So then it just comes back to a, can upgrades maybe a, pejorative or subjective term, right? Because people say, well, upgrade in terms of quality or whatever, but just pure numbers, right? And belief in what you're going to get. It just comes down to then, right, how far do you want to push the number? Right? And if you're Philippe Clement and you're looking about and you go, this guy for an extra half a million more than we would generally pay or 750,000 more than we would generally pay is probably the guy that could fire us to the title. Right? No Rangers luck. We get him and do his cruise in within about two days, right? You know what I mean? But... If that guy's can fire us to the title, right? Well, there you go. Lay that off against your Champions League qualification money, right? But you've got to take a gamble at some point. There always has to be a gamble. No signing works out. You pay bigger numbers for Sirius Dessas and Sam Lammers. They haven't worked out. Philippe Clement needs to, with Niels Coppin and the coaching team, need to reshape that forward line. It has to happen. So all we're talking about is the who. Yeah, absolutely. And we've seen that started already with the sign of Fabio Silva. Um, and he, he, I think he was, he looked, he only had 15, 20 minutes or so against Kilmarnock um, during the week, but he, he did look quite promising in terms of his movement and stuff like that during mm -hmm. during that game. John, I've noticed this morning that you've put up a thread on on Twitter or X um, about Emmanuel Dennis, and who was reportedly at the Rangers training ground during the week, being given a tour. What do you make of that? Link, he's a striker that's a, has he scored one goal this season. He's not scored yet this season. It's one of those ones. Um, no what was that? Sorry, no goals, no goals, this no season. goals this season. So I think it's like that instantly gives any any Rangers fan the fear in terms of being linked with a striker that's not scored any goals in the first half of a season. But is it uh, what, oh, what do you I've mean? Heard, I've never heard a more Rangers centric sentence when it comes to a chance. <laughs> I wonder, all right, with this guy, we just talked about Lawrence Shankland. Now, now we're going to really focus in on this guy who scored no goals. <laughs> right, John, <laughs> right, John, polish this one up for us. Can, on you go, you, mate. Here's, here's what I would say can you imagine in 2004? If Dado Purcell hadn't scored those four goals against Porto in one Champions League match and we were signing a centre-forward to lead our line who had scored six goals in the league that year, we would be questioning, going, what are we doing here? If Twitter yeah. was around, everyone would be going mental. And whose knees came his knees, his knees came <laughs> in the overhead locker on the plane, <laughs> carried them with him into the signing. So the, the, the reason I did the thread, because I see statistically, this is this is what I would say to anyone. I, I've not got the, the full finished article and what I'm doing on Twitter. Look at players' data, then look at players' video, then look at players' data closely, because you'll get a full picture if you do it. That's why I don't post a lot of data in these threads. I do more about the video, because I want to focus on the video. And one of the things, and I've said it in every part of that thread, one of the things that really stood out was the context. When he went to Ukraine for Zoria, his goals and his best performances came against Dino Kiev and Shakhtar Donetsk. When he went to Bruges, 
his performances were better in the Champions League, the Europa League, and when he played the top three teams in the Belgian League in the years he won the title. That's where his goals and assists came from. When he went to Watford, he scored against Man United, Chelsea, and an assist against Man City, Chelsea, and Man United. Um, and he scored goals in key matches in those relegation battles. His numbers against, his numbers for Watford were actually really, really impressive overall, but it was in big relegation battles and against the big teams that he really stood out. When I'm looking at Adessas, will Dessers score goals against Hibs and Hearts? I think he will. I think he'll score goals in against the teams third down. When you look at him in the old firm, he's missing something. When I looked at all those videos of uh, Dennis this morning, I was going, if he is interested, this is a guy that's for Europe and Celtic games. This is a guy that will do what Ryan Kemp was doing. He will turn up when you need a big performance. You might need other people to get you through low block Dundee games, but he will be the aggressive presser against Celtic and in Europe and the threat and behind. The things that I think we currently don't have outside of SEMA. Um, that's where I think the context is really important with him, as he seems to really have it dialed up when the big games matter. And that's the thing that's levied our squad time after time, is when it matters against Celtic, we're no good enough. Tommy John somehow managed to sell me on a no-goal striker there. Um, I don't know how he's quite... <laughs> He's quite managed that, but he's managed to he's managed to get me a wee bit interested. But where, yeah. how do you do not buy about... a car from this man? Is it, it's <laughs> going to be the it's going to be the thumbnail of the, of the podcast. <laughs> how, where do you where do you sort of land after hearing that? I guess is he one that interests you a bit? Is he one that you'd rather? No, I just want I just rather Warren Shanklin come through the door. Where do you kind of land on it? Is he he's the, he's the football siren? Like coaxing you towards the rocks is uh, is the bold join there, right? So you need to be really careful with them. Um, I actually think you do yourself in the service there, John, in terms of your your Twitter output uh, or your X output. It's it's very very good, and I think I think people engage on it in that level because they are quality threads, by the way. And I'd suggest anybody who hasn't already followed you or or read them, um, you'll get the Ranger centric stuff on this is Ibrox X, but you'll get a lot more from John as well. So I, I would suggest that you do follow them. Uh, in terms of what he's saying there, well, yeah, I mean, I've, I've spoke, I've spoken at length previously uh, in other pods about the difference between causation and correlation when it comes to data as well. And people see data and they go, that can only be the story. Actually, I know that behind the scenes at Ibrox, that feeling is very much the same as yours, John, and that they're working really hard to identify people with data and then back it up with actually getting under the skin of the clips and what it looks like and vice versa saying like we've got a feeling about this person we like it can we then back up the story with data so they don't just do it as a one-hander so very 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 much in terms of that model it's the exact same listen every signing it's a cliche but every signing's a gamble right and that uh, you're looking for somebody who can either be reinvented or who will fill a gap in the squad's capability <clears throat> to your point about getting in behind, I think you're right. Seema's the only one that really naturally does that at the moment. Everybody wants to sign a striker who scored 30 goals in the last four seasons, but how some, by some reason, rocks up on a free transfer or is available for a million pounds. Right? Oh, and they have to have scored all those goals in Europe and in a top three league. Right? Okay, right, Magic, best of luck with that. Right? Um, wherever they are, please point us in the direction and we'll go around with a big net and drag them in, right? But I, we're, we're not shopping in that market. You're shopping in markets of people who are either just about to pop, just, just about to get big numbers, or who have had good parts of their career and then fallen away, and you're looking to rehabilitate them to some extent. We got it wrong with Dessers and Lammers, right? So, but that shouldn't turn us off from being able to say, right, we need to believe in the analytics process, you need to believe in the scouting, you need to believe in it, because if you don't try and get players in, then you're sitting with what you've already got, and we all know that we need to do something different in the forward line. So, yeah, whilst I'm, I get it, I get it. Um, I, I think there'll be lots of names thrown in. Dennis might very well be in there as well, but there's, um, I, I wouldn't be against them, let's put it that way, but I think we'll see a slew of names in the forward line over the next fortnight. Yeah, absolutely. Can't wait for an uproar about every single one of them. Um, I, I think, it will, John, we'll move on to left-back. That was another area of focus that we kind of spoke about beforehand that's come more into more into the domain over the last couple of days. Is It seems that Ridvan Yilmaz is on his way out the door, heading towards Verona. 
which just so happens to be where Josh Doig is, who is one of the left backs that that Rangers have been um, linked with an with an interest in. It's it seems too easy to put two and two together and make four with with that one in terms of a, a swap plus cash kind of kind of deal. Um, Josh Doy played this weekend at the San Siro, or Giuseppe Miazza, as I suppose the Inter Milan fans would want you to to call it. Um, he's a he's a he's a player that we've all thought we should have signed him when he was leaving Hibs. No, we shouldn't have waited until now. There's other left backs we've been linked with. Keith Smile um, from Twenty is a, is one that we've been linked with, as well as uh, Kai Wagner, who has just left Philadelphia Union. Where do you stand, firstly, on the fact that Red Van Yilmaz appears to be on his way out the door, and then who you think his replacement should be? I'm actually really surprised. I was really surprised. I thought it was he was starting to perform for us. I thought he probably nailed him his position as that. I think I said before there's something he fears about him playing though. Because Hearts did it to us. Hearts did a number on us until it took ninety ninth minute for us to fix that. Um, they do. People will more and more put somebody on him at set plays. They'll put somebody on him to get out of goal kicks. They'll hang crosses up to the back post on his side. It gets messy, and I think that's something he's identified. I don't think it's a mistake that all the left backs we seem to be linked with. Although we don't know what Rangers are saying, this is us speculating. They all seem to be physically quite impressive and good in there. That would be a sign for me that he does want some because Barisic isn't small, but I've never seen Barisic win a header in my life. He I hate that Borna Barisic does that. We push in the back to make I, the ball go out for a throw in. Hides behind every time he's terrified of the ball in the air. Um, so I think he's. I think that's two things he's definitely identified as he's looking. Look at the first old firm goal, which kind of changed the game. At Celtic, we're getting a bit in top is. I'm surprised it was Seema that had such a shit header, but. We did look a bit frail a couple of times from corners. I think he's looking at just honing that a little bit. I think Lauren Shankland, we've talked about him, won't go back. But in the box set plays, he'll win every header that comes up against him. So you've got somebody in there. Barisic or Ridvan, you're a man down. You need to put them on a post or you need to have them in a zone. You can't have them going anywhere near people. If you get injuries to Asima, who, who then takes the man? Do you need to then force Ridvan to be one of the pickers? It becomes a problem. See if you've got people in all areas who are comfortable in the air and good at picking up man for set plays. So I think all three kind of cover that. The one you mentioned, Josh Doig, I think two and two, it's, it's a bit more than that because I think we're talking a boy that's played in Scotland, is Scottish, not having a good time out there. Like I know he played against Inter Milan. The, the, the club and Josh Doig need to part ways. It's as simple as that. He's not been poor. That's a myth. He's not been poor for Verona. Verona have been poor, and he's been injured in and out the team. And there has been a feeling that he wanted to leave in the summer. Verona were a team that were struggling. They were, they were very, I was very surprised he stayed up. He wants out. He wanted out in the summer. It's not improved the relationship since. It does seem like a no-brainer if they're wanting Red Van that we leverage that position and get him. If we're saying we're not in the market to spend money, you get them in a six-month loan with an option to discuss further down the line what it is they want. Because I know Verona aren't exactly plush with cash just now. So whatever deal they want Red Van on will not be paid up front unless they give us something that we're willing to say, cool, well, let's talk. Yeah, I think I think so. I think that's the Red Van news has made it more likely in my mind that this is potentially something that could happen. Initially, we saw figures, Tommy, of around £6 million, £6.5 million that Verona were looking for for Josh Doig. I, I would be surprised if that was an outlay we would put out um, at this stage of the season. I can't see that that happening. Maybe the, John just spoke about a sort of potentially six-month loan and then let's talk in the summer kind of one, which is a kind of structure of deal we seem to be seeing more and more across football in terms of loan with with um either obligation or option to buy i, I assume that is driven by the financial fair play rules etc um and it, but josh doig i think is it's an interesting one because he's been on he's been on i guess rangers fans radar since he was at hibs because we knew he was a good player we had barisic at that time barisic was potentially performing slightly better than he is just now in the last year to 18 months it's become a real focus that left back we need more and um, we obviously want to find a a left-sided James Tavernier. Whether we can do that or not, I, I'm not entirely sure. Does, does Josh Doig and that potential signing excite you? 
Uh, I don't know if I ever get excited, uh, truth, truth be told. Um, but that's that's maybe that's maybe more to do with me. But um, yeah, listen, I, and I need to admit, I, I'm not a massive. Well, sorry, I, I I'm not a massive fan, but I don't particularly have a problem with Ridvan. I thought he was playing his way. He was playing his way into the, the game. Although I, I do completely understand the structural problem there in terms of the physicality and the height and the ability for. I mean, you're overtly giving teams a, a route in to your box there in terms of playing playing high balls into him. But yeah, and we won't go down the path of right. Well, there's another example of a Scottish player who was identified as being good that you could have went for at a certain point in time, and the reductive nature of well, Barisic should have been sold at a point in time to cash in on him and all that. But because those are things that everybody here and everybody listening and watching will understand anyway. Yeah, listen, six month one, and get him at the end of the season. You've got a clause there where you get first offer. Uh, in terms of it, allows Josh Doig to come in and see if he can fill that jersey, get round about the club. It gets the coaching team the ability to assess him up close and see what he's like. It gets him into a jersey and watching him play. At a minimal risk, is he going to be any worse than Ridvan? And I say that, again, not thinking that Ridvan's the worst player. Is he going to be any worse than Barisic? I doubt it. And then there you go. So, yeah, I think there's a minimal it's a minimal risk solution to say, right, we know we need to upgrade this. You go and have a look at uh, Ridvan or, or Barisic or whatever, whoever else might come in. We'll take Doig uh, and Doig uh, in for six months, let him play, and then we have a conversation in the summer. That makes perfect sense to me, other than you know trying to snaffle a player right now when it's difficult in the January, as we've already spoken about. So yeah, minimal risk, gets one player out, gets one player in, enhances your squad, I actually think, and allows you to then see what he's like in the jersey. Because it's, as we all know, and again, it's slightly cliched, big difference being a good player. Big difference having a slightly turbulent time for all the reasons that John's laid out there uh, in Italy. That's not the same as wearing that blue jersey, right, in front of expectant fans. And so people need to be tested in that environment. You do it in a minimal risk scenario. And if it doesn't work out, right, all the best. And we kill the conversation off. So we don't have to have people shouting about Josh Doig anymore if it doesn't work out. So, yeah, press the button on it. Yeah, I think left-back's definitely an area we'll be looking to strengthen this window. I think that was obvious as soon as Owen Beck went back, uh, was called back from Dundee um, to Liverpool and we immediately tried to sign him on loan with a view to him being a, an immediate starter for us. We, I, I'm heartened by the fact that Luke Comont doesn't see Borna Barisic as the, as the starter going forward. I think that was really encouraging. Well, I took encouraging from, from that news, but I was, I was really encouraged by the fact that it, we are looking at a starter and we're looking to refresh that side of things. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how how that one comes out. In terms of other players that we've started to to look at or have been rumoured interested in, we won't go into detail on a couple of these, but central midfield, Stephen Alzati, who I think is a um, Colombian midfielder who is on loan at Standard Liège from Brighton. It, that was quashed pretty quickly in the media around being someone that may interest us in the summer, but not, not at this stage. It's not the kind of not the profile of player we're looking at so that probably kind of rules out the central midfield area for, for players that will be looking at going forward um, in terms of right winger Million Manhoff is the is the one that won't go away he's a right winger and left back I don't know how that works um, but he's a right winger and left back um, two and a half million pound from Vitesse it seems to be between ourselves and Leicester if, if Leicester are obviously motoring in the English Championship heading towards the Premier League that might be a more attractive move for him, does he go there and become an immediate starter, who knows plenty left to run in that one I think the one I wanted to come to next and, and discuss a bit further John was um, the rumoured link with Scott McKenna um, who obviously we've had our running battles with previously when he was at Aberdeen, he went to the Premier League, he went to, it was a championship at the time I think he went to Nottingham Forest I was quite surprised that he stayed there when he got to the Premier League if, if I'm honest, I've, I've watched him many times for Scotland. I think he's, I think he's an all right centre half. I don't think he's he's great. He looks every time he has the ball at his feet, I get the fear. Um, he just doesn't look comfortable. He's one of those players that just does not look comfortable with the ball at his feet at all. My main concern about this one, and I've, I understand that um, Celtic are rumoured to be interested in him as well. But my main concern about this one is, I don't think he's better than what we currently have. I think John Suter is probably a better defender than Scott McKenna. Where do you 
What do you think of that link? Yeah, I made the mistake of saying that on Twitter. <laughs> and I'm surprised at how many people seem to disagree. Like, you, you normally get disagreements, that's fine. I was surprised at how many folk actually disagreed. Uh, sorry, John, you're echoing in that bunker that you've had to, <laughs> <laughs> you've had to hide in. <laughs> do, do you know what's like, again, we're speculating. If we're interested in the four players we've covered in detail, if Scott McKenna, and I do believe there is something to it, if Scott McKenna is linked with Rangers, We've only seen this once so far under Clement. We have not ruled out a 3-5-2 formation yet in this team. Scott McKenna is a better back three left centre half than Ben Davis is. In a back four, I don't like him. But in a back three, I've seen him at Forest. I've seen him at Aberdeen play it as well at times, and I've seen him at Scotland do it. I think in a back three, he's okay. He's quite good at defending the channel. He's very aggressive in the air, so anything that comes up to him, he'll deal with. Great in both boxes. That is Scott McKenna's qualities. If you look at his aerial duels, it's as high as anyone, even in the Premier League last year. It's unbelievable, actually, how good he is in there. It covers that part. I think in a free, be really good. If I look at Josh Doig, just come back quickly, comfortable playing left wing back. It's where he's been playing. He's doing it for Scotland. Scotland are in that system. Shanklin, Dennis, people who are naturally centre forwards but can play in a two and have played in a two, especially in the 3 5 2. I wouldn't rule out that there's a bit more to this than what we're seeing and what Clement's maybe looking at. I know we don't we we turn our nose down a little bit at three five two. I think McKenna makes sense if he's looking at Ben Davis having to play a three five two and defend channels. And if he does play that three five two, he needs a wing back that's willing to do things himself, which is what Josh Doig is good at. Josh Doig reminds me of when people were stupidly playing Gareth Bale at left back in his earlier days. Somebody who can drive and drive and drive with the ball and get you up the park. Um Scott McKenna for me is only better in that three five two as a back four. I don't think he's better than what we have. Tommy is. I, I I if we sign Scott McKenna, I'm not sure I'll be overly enamoured by by that one. It's not one that would that really interests me. Um, where do you land on that link and your interest as a Rangers fan and seeing it happen? Well, I actually, would give you some credence that Scott McKenna tattoo that you've got on your <laughs> on your on your back, but. Uh, no, listen, I, I think, again, uh, John's, John's nailed it. I have the exact same thoughts on McKenna. In the three, where he's allowed to be a little bit more aggressive and step out, uh, I think he's really, really good. And that kind of compact shape. In the four, he gets exposed. Um, he's, he's susceptible to the ball behind him. He doesn't naturally get close enough to his partner sometimes, but in a three, he can uh, make it a little bit more congealed. And it protects him as well. I, I don't think naturally he's better than a lot of what we have. He's more aggressive than Davies. That left-sided part of the central pairing is something that we've struggled with. It doesn't naturally have to be a left footer or anything like that. I think that can be overblown sometimes. Of what oh, needs to be a natural left-sided player. No, I no, just want somebody who can defend and who understands their position. Um, you look at Suter, I think, he's, I think he's a really good defender. But again, some of this speaks to Philippe Clement is trying to reshape the team. He's also trying to do succession planning because you don't know what's going to happen in the summer in terms of other centre backs, you know, maybe leaving or whatever. Uh, and we are a little bit um, disjointed in that position in terms of who we've got in the, in the building. I, I wouldn't imagine that Davies will still be here post summer, actually, if we can find a club for him or if he can find a club. So, yeah, I mean, again, if you're getting it, if you're getting Scott McKenna and is he is he going to degrade the squad? No. Is he going to allow you that flexibility to play three? Yeah. Do you know what you're getting? Yeah. On a, a man for V man, he's he's very good, actually. And he can match up with that type of thing. I think having somebody else who's really aggressive in there helps. It would also help, for example, with a Goldson stepping out uh, a little bit. So, yeah, I mean, he's. I think he's all right, actually. I think he's an all right defender. He's not going to... He's not going to be breaking the lines unless that's coached into him at this point. But, aye, if you get him at a reasonable cost or, or not, um, and he can come in and he replaces somebody like a Davies or whatever, who I think sometimes gets a little bit of a bad press, which is unwanted, truth be told. But, um, aye, it's a bit of a chum, actually. It doesn't excite me. It doesn't keep me up at night, that particular one on McKenna. 
Yeah, you managed. You you both managed to convince me and Emmanuel Dennis, but um, you've not done it with Scott McKenna whatsoever. So, <laughs> do, do you know? Do you know the only thing that's it's niggling? And I know this isn't football manager or FIFA, and I know this isn't how transfers tend to be structured. But sometimes, like we said with Josh Doig, two plus two makes sense. We're all looking at Scott McKenna as the Ben Davis potential replacement over the summer and longer term. John Suter, depending on injuries, could go to a Euros, but he's not going to go to a Euros playing every once every four games for Rangers. John Suter has a lot of connections at Hearts. Hearts have had a lot of injuries at centre half. They've had to play left wing backs here and left backs here. We want a player from Hearts. Hearts would want money and potentially a quality player to go there who isn't playing with us as much as I like the guy. John Suter could go to Hearts the other way with money and make a Euros and Hearts are in a back three where they're playing Stephen Kingsley over that side. Frankie Kent's been good. Craig Halkett's coming back. Kai Rolls, I don't rate. He's been there. He knows Stephen A. Smith. I don't know if we're I don't know if there's other stuff we're trying to figure out when we're financially struck about getting Suter back the other way and getting him playing and it suits all parties. I'd be very disappointed if that was the case. I'd be very disappointed to see John Suter go. I think John Suter could naturally be Liam Balogun. Hopefully, won't go in. I'm a big fan of Liam Balogun, but you can see this season he's lost yep. many yards of pace, not just one yard of pace. Um, and I think he um, he's, he's been a good stopgap this season. I think it was the right thing to bring him in, and he's he's done as well in a number of a number of games. But I can't see him going into next season. And really, John Suter. Maybe if you sign Scott McKenna, that that changes that picture. But John Suter, for me at this moment in time, will be or should be the main partner for Connor Goldson next season. So I think I'd be really disappointed with that if that were to happen. So if you unpick that then, and it's an interesting one from John actually, but if you unpick that and you say, right, you get to the end of the season and you keep Goldson, let's say you keep Suter, right? Balogun and Davies leave, right? Or a combination of that. You're two centre-backs down. You're looking at the academy and you're wondering, right, who can step up? Right? Question mark. But also you want to bring in somebody else as well. Now, are you going to play that three? And is your three starting going to be Suter, Goldson, and then McKenna? Mm. Don't entirely sure that would fill everybody with confidence. Or two of Suter and Goldson. You're still going to have at least two backups there. Really? Now, do you go with a, a person like a McKenna and somebody else who's experienced to bring in? Or do you step somebody up from the academy? It just depends how many centre-backs you really naturally want in there. I think four to five is a reasonable number, with one of them definitely having to be youth if you've got five. McKenna would fit that mould, and it comes back to some of the stuff we are talking about Shankland. Could Scott McKenna drop in and play the majority of your domestic games and do them to a reasonable level of quality? Yeah, he could. He's proven that at Aberdeen. So, yeah, then you're looking at somebody else who's maybe got a little bit more flair up ability to do a different job in certain games but you know could you see Scott McKenna playing in an old firm game there's the question he's both yeah I, 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 I don't know about that one but we're fast marching on and we're running out of time so if, if you can see Scott McKenna playing for Rangers or playing an old firm game do let us know in the comments and we'll make sure that we do, we do come back to you on that one and I'm sure this won't be the last time we discuss that one either just one more thing, we've only got a couple of minutes left, but the one more thing I wanted to touch on and get your thoughts on, it does It does look like Sam Lammers is on his way out the door, John. Um, no one wants to buy him, perhaps, unsurprisingly, um, but it does seem like he's, he's on his way on loan. Michael Beal in Sunderland re- registering an interest, which you'd think he'd, he'd learn from his, his previous mistakes, but potentially not. Um and an unnamed Dutch club, I believe he was at Herenveen before and they're potentially linked with being interested again. It's just, it's, he's had, I feel like Sam Lammers has had more than enough game time to try and prove himself and he's just, he's just not done it. He has. I, mean, I would say that, I would say that. And it's like the Michael Wheel thing, like there's so much aggression and so much annoyance towards him. But see when they go, that's a done. So see if he goes, good luck to him and he can go and uh, hopefully be a success elsewhere. I think we're guilty of like assuming that who would buy him? I keep, I keep hearing this. This does my nothing. Oh, it's easier saying you want Dessers and Lammers. Who would buy them? We bought them. Teams have bought them before. A lot of clubs will look outside the data. They'll look outside what happened at that club. They'll go, maybe it just didn't work. Players don't leave Rangers and their careers finish. The amount of shite we've had that have had careers for 10, 15 years and made plenty of money doing and playing football. 
somebody will take him, somebody will look at what they've got and go, didn't he work there? He'll fit our system. Maybe Michael Beal was just so persistent because he's seen something in training every day that when no Lammers is playing that 10, he can play in that 10. He'll be fine in there. He's had enough time at us. I think what Tommy said about Josh Doig coming to Rangers, you don't know how somebody's going to be until they're in front of 50,000 Rangers fans. And Sam Lammers has just not been able to grasp that part of it. And he's never going to be able to. It's just, it's too too much at Rangers. You need to have the right mentality to do it. And he just unfortunately doesn't. That doesn't mean he'll be a bad player elsewhere. He did score against Newcastle. So maybe that's the appeal for Michael Beal and Sunderland on that one. Um, Tommy, just final word on Sam Lammers. It's, it's just, it's it's just not same. Ah, it's the exact same. Listen, nobody goes out to be a bad player, and we've all we all know the rumours internally of actually in training Sam Lammers sets it on fire. But it comes back to that point: you put on the jersey, you get in front of a live environment, you get in front of the fans, and it's not happened. He's had more than enough game time. Wish the guy all the best. I, I generally do. I would have loved it if it had worked for him. And I actually think he'll go somewhere else, and he'll be all right. Right? He's, he's not. A, it's not as bad technically as people maybe think and throw all the baby out with the bathwater there, so to speak. Best luck to him. If we can get him off our books at some point, I mean, you're going to take a loss. Right, it's really that simple. Nobody's, I don't think anybody's going to pay the amount that we paid for him. But you get him off the books, you get him off the wages. I'm with John. As soon as somebody leaves Rangers, I tend to slightly put them into a different box. Best of luck to the guy. I hope his career flourishes. Don't have anything against him. He's not a Rangers player, though. That chapter needs to close as soon as the club can possibly close it. And on that nice, wholesome note, we'll round off the podcast um, there. Thank you very much to John and Tommy for joining us to talk about all things Rangers transfers as the January transfer window continues to hot up. Please, if you've got any thoughts on any of the, the players that we've discussed, if you've heard of any other transfer rumours, that, or there's any players that you think would be interesting to see in a Rangers jersey, drop them in the comments. Make sure you drop a like on the video if you've enjoyed the content. It really does help us. And subscribe to the TII YouTube channel and you'll get um, a notification every single time we go live. In terms of what we've got coming up, next week will be our, um, our two-part mid-season review as we look back on... All that's happened, and I can't believe it's only been half a season when you actually do look back at everything that's happened to Rangers so far. Um, we've been up, we've been down, we've been round in circles, and we're somehow in a title race, top of the Europa League group. And uh, we've, uh, we've already got the Viaplay Cup in the locker. So plenty to discuss, and we'll be breaking that down over a two-part um, series that comes out on Wednesday and Sunday next week. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And until next time, goodbye.